You may be seated. Well, it is a delight to see Mrs. Pappas with us tonight. So glad you're able to make it. And also, uh, for those of you who do not know about it or who didn't see them to pick them up, we do have the headphones available for those who want to listen with the little uh, assistive listening system. So uh, I hope Megley gave them to everybody if you happen to need those. Now tonight, and they're on the front pew if uh, otherwise, tonight we are looking at the book of Acts once again, a very exciting passage because as we've discovered, Peter is laying down basic principles that we find restated over and over and over again in the New Testament. Expanded by the Apostle Paul, expanded by Peter in his epistles, expanded by John in his short epistles. We discover that the things that are transpiring in Acts chapter 11, as the gospel is now being shared with the Gentiles, and Peter is on the carpet, he's having to give a defense of what he did in Acts chapter 10, he systematically explains what God is doing, why you and I, as Gentiles, are now part of the body of Christ. Some great principles that are laid down for us here, and we're looking at Acts chapter 11 and verses 4 through 18, the third part of systematic exposition and witness. That was a mistake in the bulletin this morning. That message is next time about the first people being called Christians because we still have a little more and very important material to cover tonight that Peter lays down here in Acts 11 which Paul then expounds in multiple other epistles of the New Testament. Our text, Acts chapter 4, starting, uh, 11, starting in verse 4. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descended as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting, Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift, as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we view this text again tonight and consider what an incredible, marvelous thing you have done for us as Gentiles, bringing us in on a co-equal basis with the Jews as you brought them in in Acts chapter 2, and then the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. And then the Ethiopian eunuch, one who is neither male nor female, Gentile by birth and Jewish by religion, at the end of Acts 8 and now in Acts 10, have brought in 
those who are fully Gentile, those who are of the oppressor nation, on a co-equal basis with those who had been keepers of the law. Father, it helps us to realize the grace of God. We certainly don't deserve it, but you have provided it. And we pray, Father, for your blessings on your word tonight, that it will take root in our hearts, and that we will understand what a gift this is that has been given to us, that we also could be called Christians, that we might be those who are truly the followers of Jesus Christ, through faith in him alone. We pray, Father, for your blessings on this your word tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall that last week we opened with the summary principle that Peter illustrates in our text, and Paul states it in Romans 14.22. When dealing with the two issues in that context of food fights and circumcision, the message of three weeks ago. And Paul here takes the principles that Peter has illustrated in practice and says, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And that's a powerful principle that Paul summarizes all the different areas of the Christian life. Everything we do must be an act of faith. Faith is not merely head knowledge. Faith is not merely something that hides out inside our hearts. Faith is something that affects the way that we live. Everything we do must be an act of faith. There are no exceptions. As you go through life, you make decisions day by day. Are you doing it by faith? Are you doing it in doubt? Or are you simply doing it mindlessly? You know, being in a neutral position is not moving forward in the Christian life. When we do things mindlessly, we are not walking by faith. We need to consciously say, Lord, everything I do today, I want to do it in faith, not in fear. I want to do it in faith, not in doubt. I want to do it in faith, not mindlessly because it's a habit. I want to do it for the glory of God, in the power of your spirit, and in a way that is in obedience to the word of God. Help me learn the principles, and that's what we're discussing at this time, the, the principles that are laid down by Peter here in Acts chapter 11, and then which Paul and others in the New Testament expound with detail so that we can know how to apply them in other areas of the Christian life. The Christian life, not merely the Christian theology, the Christian life that glorifies Jesus Christ. Peter has just given a systematic exposition of what happened in chapter 10, of course, and uh, he's been doing it in the context of Gentiles, the uncircumcised, and doing it in the context of food, because there were great dietary laws, as you know, in the Old Testament. And last week we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, about things offered to idols. And it's totally different than those food fights that we saw in Acts chapter 10, but it was the same topic, the issue of food. We still have those kinds of food fights today in the church as to what you can eat and what you can't eat and things like that. And Paul has talked about those who are the weaker brothers and those who are the stronger brothers. And he points out that it's not an issue of your knowledge, it's an issue of your love for the brothers. Head knowledge puffs you up and makes you proud. Love builds the church up by yielding our rights. A mature Christian will always be willing to yield his rights for the sake of a weaker Christian. Now, the weaker Christian is not supposed to stay weak. They're supposed to grow. But as we raise children, for example, we as parents often yield our rights so that we can take care of the children. We put aside the things that we would like to be doing so that we can take care of the, the little hurts, the scraped knees, the bee stings, and things like that. Because we love the children. But our goal is to see those children grow up so that they can learn to take care of those things themselves. To have the children grow up so that they can do some of the cooking, for example. Have the children grow up so that daddy doesn't always have to cut the grass, but little boy gets big enough where he can push the lawnmower. The goal of the Christian life 
is get to spiritual maturity the way the Bible says we're supposed to do it. And these are the things that are used as illustrations so that we can learn principles about that. And so we talked about the food that's been offered to idols in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We talked about 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and how the Christian life is also a matter of the conscience and how we are not to violate the conscience God has given us and how we are not to violate the conscience of a weaker brother. Certainly we are not to violate the conscience of someone else by doing something that is immoral. There are people out there and... I've met them both in high school and in college and later on in life who have all kinds of suave arguments for why it's okay to do certain immoral things. And they violate other people's consciences and it's sin. Dear friends, be careful. When we talk about yielding our rights, we are not talking about yielding moral principle. What we're talking about is yielding our personal rights for the sake of weaker brothers and not causing weaker brothers to stumble by insisting on doing something that is a violation of the word of God. Remember, the weaker brother is the one who will be tempted by you, the stronger brother, to violate his or her conscience. We're not talking about things that are clearly stated to be moral or immoral in scripture. We're talking about the things that are adiaphorous, the things that by themselves, without a context, are neutral. It's in those areas that we yield our rights if we cause someone else to stumble. That brought us to the last illustration or illustrations that I gave last week, the issue of the lifeboat scenario, the situational ethics business, the film series we saw, Against All Odds, Israel Survives, and how the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto chose to, rather than violate their consciences and violate scripture, though all they had was the Old Testament, they chose rather to die than to kill some of their own. And then the example I gave you of the people jumping out of the airplane. So that brings us tonight to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 29, 25 through 29 where Paul is again expounding what Peter has just illustrated in Acts 11. In some cases it's permitted to eat, in some cases it is not permitted to eat because the food itself is not intrinsically evil. And here's what Paul writes. We covered just barely the surface of this. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles that is, in the food market that's attached to the pagan temple, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, so suppose your unsaved neighbor, you've been trying to witness to them. You want to see them come to Christ. And they invite you over for a barbecue. That's the context here. And you think, that'd be great. I'd get to get to their home. We sit down. We, we're having dinner together, and we can perhaps bring up some spiritual things. Jesus did that like with the woman at the well. Uh, he took a drink from a Samaritan woman. It's a bad no-no. But he did it because he was going to show her that he was the water of life. So you go next door and you are at the barbecue with your pagan friend. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go... Eat whatever is set before you. Eat it, asking no questions for conscience sake. You're not, as we pointed out last week, obliged to check it out first. But if any say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake. It's very important. You don't eat it if he says this has been offered to idols. Because, you see, he still has a sensitivity as a pagan that the idol is something. Now, Paul has already told us in chapter 8 that the idol is nothing. But the pagan doesn't really know that yet. And your goal is not to try to slap him around and tell him this is what Christians really believe. 
Your goal is to gently lead him to Christ. And so when he says that to you, he is testing you because he has a preconceived idea about what Christians believe. Now, it may not be right. It's clearly not right what he thinks Christians believe in the context of what Paul has just written. But the Apostle Paul wants us to understand that we have a responsibility not only to keep from hindering our weaker brother, but we also have a responsibility to keep from hindering a pagan that we're trying to lead to Christ. Don't put a stumbling block in front of the weak brother. Don't put a stumbling block in front of the pagan that clouds the issues of Jesus alone. How often we want to show off our knowledge or we want to show off our superiority and we miss pointing people to Christ. That's what we see happening here. But what about this business of conscience sake? For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, I didn't read the preceding verses before verse 25, but Paul started this section with that same quotation out of the Old Testament. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Then he goes through and discusses this business of meat sold in the shambles. And then he closes that section with the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In other words, we recognize that we can eat anything that the Lord has made. That was the point of the sheet let down from heaven that Peter saw that he is recounting back there in Acts chapter 11. You may not want to eat everything, but you're permitted to eat anything that the Lord has made. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now verse 29, and this is where we want to really take hold of it tonight. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. And then he asks a question. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? That doesn't seem fair. Why is my liberty? I have a liberty to eat that meat. I know it doesn't have idol cooties on it. <laughs> why can't I eat that meat? The idol didn't come down and squirt a demon inside of it. It's that guy's conscience that's got a problem. It's not my conscience that's got a problem. It's not my liberty. I have Christian liberty. How often have you heard people insist on their own Christian liberty? Paul says, even in the context of a pagan, you don't insist on your own liberty. And he asks the question, but do you notice something? He doesn't answer the question in the following verses. We'll look at them in just a second. He was given, he, he threw out a specific question. Why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? But instead of answering the question directly, he explains a principle. Now folks, we're dealing with principles that are established by the word of God so that we don't just you know, put everything into little pigeonhole kind of boxes and everything else is up for grabs. Specific illustrations are used in scripture so that we can learn principles that apply to every area of the Christian life. Very, it's so important to understand that because Paul does this many, many times in his writings. He'll ask a question and then he'll let it apparently go unanswered. But he always gives, in that context, a principle by which he forces the readers to draw the correct conclusion. And that's what he is doing here. Now, an immature reader will always want Paul to answer the question directly. But Paul wants us to see the principle that gives not only the answer to that specific question, but has a hugely broader application. Let me give you an illustration. For example, suppose the question is, can I go 26 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour speed zone? Now, I suspect all of us have done that whether deliberately or inadvertently, we've probably all gone through a 25 mile an hour speed zone. Maybe we didn't see the sign. Maybe we saw the sign and looked in our rearview mirror to see if there was a policeman behind us. Maybe we saw the sign and thought, I'm late for work, I gotta do it anyway. And we made some kind of a rationalization or excuse. Or we thought, ah, my speedometer probably isn't right. You know, <laughs> you know you've been there, haven't you? We all do this kind of stuff. <laughs> 
We constantly rationalize away our conscience, and Paul talks about that in the earlier chapters of Romans. But that's the question. And so the immature reader, when that question is raised, will say, well, what's the answer, yes or no? Can I go 26 mile an hour in a 25 mile an hour speed zone? Because really that's not very bad. That's not much at all. Well, it's 4% faster than the speed limit, but it's the kind of thing that we want to know what really is the boundary? What really is the edge? But you know, if Paul were going to answer that question, he would probably answer it with something like, instead of saying no, he would instead say something like this. Traffic laws set absolute boundaries. It's sin to break the speed limit. By answering in that manner, he would not have to answer all of the follow-up questions like, well then, can I go 56 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone? You know, we always want to know. He gives you a principle by which you can then answer not only the question that's been asked, but you can answer a whole lot of other questions too. But of course, we're sinful human beings, and we always like to look for loopholes, so we would probably ask another question anyway. Are there any exceptions to the speed limit laws? And Paul would probably answer something like this. The authority in charge of making the laws has the right to make exceptions. But this is a matter of local law and state ordinances. For example, you might or might not be exonerated for rushing a heart attack patient to the hospital, but you might have to appear before a local magistrate to explain yourself. Now, instead of answering the question directly and saying, yeah, it's um, sin to go 56 in a 55 mile an hour zone, or instead of saying, are there, yeah, there are exceptions to the law without any context, he would give you some principles. And that's what's happening here. You get the idea. Paul doesn't answer the question directly, but he begins to discuss a series of five principles. And here they are, starting in verse 30 now. We're in 1 Corinthians 10. For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? Principle number one is when you're doing this, are you doing it because you're insisting on your Christian liberty, on your rights, or is it because it is something for which you are giving God thanks? Too often we miss that principle when someone makes the hackles on the back of our neck stand up by resisting what we think we have the right to do. Instead of looking at it as an opportunity to give God thanks. Then he goes on. Whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, you get it? He's getting beyond the eat and the drink. It's not just food fights and circumcision here. It's whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's a principle. It covers not just food, it covers every area of the Christian life. Now the question has been, you know, why do I get judged by the other man's conscience for, you know, and I don't, I don't get to eat that beautiful steak that he just barbecued that came from the pagan temple. You have to do everything for the glory of God. Here's the third principle, verse 32. Give none offense. Neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Everybody falls into one of those three categories in the entire world. They fall into one of those three categories. They're either Jews, or they're Gentiles, or they're part of the church of God. If you're saved, you're part of the church of God. You don't have to worry about those ethnic distinctions that the Jews and the Gentiles worry about and why they're holocaust by people like Hitler trying to eradicate Jews and Jews who look down their noses as the Orthodox, the Dati'im, do in Israel, the Gentiles, the Goyim, you're now part of the church of God where there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Where regardless of a man's ethnicity, regardless of his background, regardless of his race, regardless of his color, he's now part of the body of Christ. Co-equal basis. Remember, that's what we're dealing with here in Acts chapter 11. 
God bringing Gentiles into the body of Christ on a co-equal basis with the Jews who were brought in in Acts chapter 2. So giving none offense, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God. Verse 33, even as I please all men in all things, now here is the kicker. Remember, he's just been talking about why is my liberty judged of the other guy's conscience? Here's the kicker. Not seeking mine own profit. Now, a spiritually minded reader will be able to read that and say, you know, I should not have asked that question. Because that question manifest a heart motivation inside myself that I'm number one. It manifests an internal character problem with me because I'm seeking my own rather than the last phrases of this verse, but the profit of many that they may be saved. See, the question dealt with a pagan who's invited you to dinner. But the principles that Paul gives to answer the question apply not merely about meat offered to idols that a pagan has bought to test you as a Christian. These are five principles that apply to every area of the Christian life. And it all goes back to Peter's defense in Acts chapter 11. You see, many folks read through the book of Acts and they say, that's neat, that's church history. And it is. It's church history. But why did God choose the specific instances? Because there were a lot of things that happened in the early church during the lifetime of the apostles that did not get recorded in the book of Acts. Why did God inspire the things that we see in the book of Acts? Is because they are laying a foundation, as we say in law, they are laying a foundation upon which everything else will fit and be built so that the body of Christ will be solid. And that there won't be the divisions and the fights that we see taking place in the early church. And when you get off that foundation, you suddenly have disruption and destruction in the church. It's magnificent. And Paul is taking that and then showing how it applies to many other areas of life. Why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? Do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. Context is an unsaved person, and you don't want to put something between that person and Christ because you've insisted on your Christian liberty. In other words, the answer to the question really is another question. What impact will my actions have in at least those five different areas. And in any and every case, as we've already seen and we talked about a moment ago in detail, it is always right to maintain a clear conscience in yourself as well as in the one that you are witnessing to or in the conscience of a weaker brother. Not a seared conscience. There are people who have seared their conscience. We'll talk about that in a second in 1 Timothy 4 2. But first, the necessity for us as believers to have a clear conscience. Did you know that when you wound the weaker conscience of a weaker brother, or when you wound the conscience of a pagan, that there will be something nagging at the back of your conscience too? It's the way God has made us. We sense that something went wrong. And if you're spiritually sensitive, you will immediately confess it as sin to God and make it right with the one whose conscience you have offended. Conscience. Let me just read you a few verses. 1 Timothy 1.5 Now the end of the commandment. In other words, after everything is said and done, after all the arguments have come in and gone out, when we finally reach the conclusion, the end of the commandment is charity, that's agape love, out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. 
Those three things summarize the well-lived Christian life. The first thing, what is it? Love out of a pure heart. He's not talking about eros. He's not talking about sensual love. He's not even talking about phileo, which is human love. The end of the commandment is God's kind of love that flows out of a heart that is pure. If you're involved in immorality, it won't flow out of a pure heart. God's love doesn't flow out of impure hearts. If you're involved in deceit, you won't have love flowing out of a pure heart. If you're involved in backbiting and backstabbing, you won't have love flowing out of a pure heart. If you're involved in greed and covetousness and perhaps even theft, you won't have love flowing out of a pure heart because you're not doing to your brother what you would have done to you. You're not in a sacrificial position like Christ was. Instead, you're in a grabbing position. The end of the commandment is, first of all, love out of a pure heart. That's the first principle for the well-lived Christian life. The second thing is a good conscience. You will not have a well-lived Christian life if you do not have a clear conscience. Your conscience will always be nagging you. Your conscience will always be there to pull you back every time you try to witness because it will say to you, Ah, don't you remember what you did? How can you, you hypocrite, say anything about this? Hebrews 9.14 How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The blood of Christ not only provides forgiveness for sin, the blood of Christ provides cleansing of the conscience. So the well-lived Christian life, principle number two, is it will have a good conscience. The third principle here, and of faith unfeigned. That is, genuine faith, not phony faith, not fake faith, but genuine faith. It's not make-believe, it's not pretend, it's faith that is unfeigned. It's real. Rather interesting as we look at the conscience, as we look at not only the conscience of the weaker brother, the conscience of the pagan, but at our own conscience, that is one of the goals of the well-lived Christian life. To have a good conscience, whereby it doesn't have to nag us because we haven't dealt with it the way God said we're supposed to deal with it when we've sinned in our own life. 1 Timothy chapter 3, two chapters later, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. You know, you cannot remain doctrinally sound. It's not just faith, it's the faith. When you see it with a definite article, you're talking about that body of truth once and for all delivered to the saints, as Jude tells us. Earnestly contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to believers. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. You cannot remain doctrinally sound if you violate your conscience. You will begin to compromise your doctrine because the doctrine will condemn what you're doing and not confessing. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you of your good conversation in Christ. You won't worry about what other people say about you because you have a clear conscience. They're not even partly right when they accuse you. You have a conscience that is void of offense both toward God and toward men, as Paul said in his defense later in the book of Acts. Do you have a good conscience? You know, it's interesting as we look at it in the Bible, there are two things that are always connected to a clear conscience. Number one, the conscience is always connected to faith. Remember that. 
When you begin to have a conscience that is not clear, begin to look at your walk of faith. Number two, a clear conscience is always subject to faith. It's connected to faith and it is subject to faith. And what happens when you violate faith? You will have a wrecked conscience and you will have a wrecked life. Listen to what Paul writes to young Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. Here we find them together, faith and conscience. Holding faith and a good conscience which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. When you violate faith, you will violate your conscience and make shipwreck. They're connected. Too often we try to isolate things, and doctrinally we can do that. We can talk about how certain things fit different categories. But in practical Christianity, which is, folks, what I'm trying to by the grace of God, to live in front of you and to teach you not just doctrine, we hear doctrine till it comes out our ears, and it's right, and it's true, and it's good. But it must come over into the Christian life. I beg you, see that. Believe it. Practice it. What happens in Acts chapter 11 is setting forth principles that are now being expounded throughout the doctrinal epistles of the New Testament where the practical application of those principles is being given. Yeah, there's a danger of violating your conscience by violating faith. But what if you do it many times? There are some people who just keep trampling their conscience for whatever sinful reason they happen to have. Paul explains it to Timothy three chapters later in 1 Timothy 4.1. <clears throat> now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Now, <laughs> that's a really strong statement there. Here's something that is specific that the Holy Spirit wants you to know. Here is something that is a guaranteed warning. The Spirit speaketh expressly. That in the latter times, and I think you are aware of the fact that we live in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Now remember we talked about a connection between the faith and a clear conscience. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, that is supernaturally induced moral deviation. You know it's not merely the flesh that is fighting our young people today. Though the flesh is in there, opening the door like a quizzling, for the enemy of the demons to come in. But there is a supernaturally induced moral deviation and we see it flooding our country. Not merely normal lusts of the flesh, but demonically motivated lusts in all kinds of perverted things. The Spirit specifically warns about that. It specifically tells us when it's going to happen in the latter times. Some shall depart from the faith. They move away from sound doctrine. And now they are supernaturally induced into moral deviation. And not merely do they move away from the faith. Look at what it says in the last part of the verse. 1 Timothy 4.1 And doctrines of devils. That's daimonion, that's demons there. Doctrines of devils, supernaturally induced theological deviation connected to the supernaturally induced moral deviation. Verse 2, speaking lies, and of course you know Satan is the father of all lies. Jesus said so in John chapter 8 and verse 44. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. You know what that says? That tells you that they know what they're doing. A hypocrite is someone who is faking it deliberately. He's someone who's acting pompous and proud, but doing it when he tells you not to. That's why kids many times don't like their parents, because the parents say, do what I say, not what I do. And the parents are busy out there drinking and smoking, but they're telling the kids, we don't want you to get on drugs. And the kid says, well, it's just a matter of which drugs. <laughs> 
Drugs of choice. You choose tobacco and alcohol, and I choose pot. You choose tobacco and alcohol, and I choose LSD, or heroin, or it's deviation crack. Folks, the false teachers will teach lies in hypocrisy. They know what they are doing when they are teaching you a lie. Having their conscience, ah, here is our key. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. When you violate your conscience multiple times, it's like taking a red hot branding iron and searing the conscience. When the conscience is seared, it no longer has feeling. Some of you have had bad burns, and you know that those, those burn scars, although the skin is healed back up, you can see the scar, but if you poke it with a needle, you don't feel anything. People who violate their conscience over and over again get a seared conscience. And it will bring them to the point where they are susceptible to demonically induced moral deviation and demonically induced false doctrine. You don't want to go there. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Verse 3 gives a couple of illustrations. Forbidding to marry. So what Paul is saying here, Paul is calling Roman Catholic celibate priesthood a teaching a doctrine of demons. That doctrine, as you know, has led to sodomy, fornication between priests and nuns, child molestation in the priesthood. And I know you periodically read about those cases in the newspaper. And most recently, the comment by the Pope in the last few weeks about how he does not condemn homosexual priests. And the newspapers were all joyed about that, that there's a shift and a change in Rome. No, it's not a change. It's simply there's a uh, coming out in the open a little bit. The verse goes on, and commanding to abstain from meats, and here we go back to the food fights that we discussed in Acts chapter uh, 11. And of course, it is also reflected in the Roman Catholic former prohibition against eating meat on Friday which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving. Ah, remember, that's what Paul just talked about, the giving of thanks, one of the principles that controls things, of them that believe and know the truth. So here we are back again at that food fight issue that was so bitterly fought back in Acts chapter 10 and 11. Verse 4, For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Why am I judged of another man's conscience for that for which I give thanks? You see, the theme is the same as we go through all of these different areas of Scripture. Verse 5, For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Whatever the food is, we're no longer under the dietary laws of the Old Testament. It is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. The Bible, the word of God, says it's okay to eat anything, any creature. Prayer sets the food apart for service to God. Prayer is the giving of thanks for what God has provided for us to eat. Have you ever wondered why Christians are, have historically prayed for their food before meals? Those two verses give you the answer. We are not required to eat everything, but we are permitted to eat anything. I know you've heard about missionaries who have been on the foreign field, and um, they're on the foreign field. Sometimes they have to eat some pretty weird stuff, like roasted grubs and so on. You know, um, not long ago, we came across a, a container in our home with uh, a oatmeal, and it was full of moth grubs. They had hatched out inside this thing. And you'd open the lid of the thing, and the moths would fly out. And I eat oatmeal every morning for breakfast. And so as they would fly out, I would try to smack them. Or if I could open it and see one on the side, I'd smash it on the side. Then I would take out a cup of the oatmeal, 
put it into the bowl, pouring it in carefully. And if I could find the grubs, I'm not real partial to grubs, or the little larvae, the maggots that were in there, I would pick them out. But you know, I don't waste food. It's something God has given. And I thank God for that food and for giving me that illustration for this message. Because uh, <laughs> I would then uh, cook them oatmeal in the microwave and bring it out. And uh, occasionally I'd find one maggot or so that had been cooked. And, you know, not being real partial to maggots, I'd take it out. But I didn't throw the oatmeal away. I ate it. And I'm sure that I ate, I have no idea, how many maggots. That was a large container of oatmeal. Folks, every creature of God is good. And nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And I can give God thanks for that, because I know that there have been Christians in prisons where they've had to kill and eat rats without cooking them. Eat the various creepy crawly things that have come crawling across the floor of their prison cell. What we need to learn to do is, yes, we can have choices on these things, but every creature of God is good. And nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified. It is set apart by the word of God and prayer. Paul goes on in 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. This is that entire passage, verses 1 through 6. In verse 6 he says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, all that stuff we've just talked about in relation to the food and the circumcisions and the principles of meat offered unto idols and all these different things that tied in to Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up, We've been talking about eating, haven't we? Now Paul is going to say, that's an illustration of something. Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. In other words, our freedom in Christ has released us from all of the dietary restrictions of the Mosaic law. And now it's an issue of faith and good doctrine. The job of the minister is to, quote, put the brethren in remembrance of these things. The weaker brethren need to be made strong. They are not to be coddled and pampered in their weakness, demanding baby state. They're required to grow up. We treat them gently as they're growing. We restrict our own rights while they're growing to keep them from stumbling and from violating their conscience. But they are required by the word of God to be made strong by hearing and believing the word of God and then practicing the truth in faith. You know, circumcision, dietary laws are just like the tabernacle, the sacrifices, the priesthood, and the other things in the Old Testament, which were types and symbols of deeper spiritual reality in the life of the believer. There are many rich and rewarding Bible conferences that have been preached on all of those types and symbols, the tabernacle. You heard me do a whole series on the tabernacle. And the sacrifices, and you heard a partial series on the sacrifices, and the priesthood. It's a magnificent type and picture of our Lord Jesus Christ in his Melchizedekian priesthood in Hebrews 7. And you've heard a lot of sermons on those things, but you know, I've never heard a Bible conference preached on circumcision and food fights. But those are issues that also have great doctrinal significance. I hope you're beginning to pick this up. And great typological significance. For example, hear what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, where he uses it as a type and a picture to teach a deeper spiritual truth. Colossians 2, 11. In whom also, that is in Christ, ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So in other words, he's not talking about physical circumcision. But he uses it as an illustration in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Physical circumcision here is used as a physical object lesson to teach a spiritual truth. Circumcision that counts with God is the circumcision of the heart, not the flesh. 
A circumcised heart is one through which the pure seed of the word passes. Conception takes place. New birth occurs for the glory of God. Romans 2 verse 29, Paul says, But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. It's not the importance of the external act which the Jews were so proud of. He's a Jew which is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. On the issue of food, there's also another bottom line principle that is repeated that we must glorify God in what we do. We just read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. You remember that? It says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do. There's the broad principle. Going back to the food issue, but it's a broad principle. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That general principle is repeated in Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. Very important verses. I memorized these very young, and they were sort of my life verses out of the New Testament for a long time. And I had one out of Book of Proverbs as well, as a life verse. But here he says, whatsoever you do. Do you think that covers everything in life? You bet it does. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. You do it all to the glory of God. You do it heartily as unto the Lord. You'd be willing to restrict your own Christian liberty for the sake not only of your own conscience, but for the sake of the conscience of the unbeliever, the sake of the conscience of the weaker brother, you do it for the glory of God. Everything in Christian life is to be positive. It is for the glory of God. Not neutral, not just because you can get away with it, but for the glory of God. Well, our time is beginning to run out. Our text, Acts chapter 11, 4 through 8, Peter rehearses that incident there in chapter 10 that took place immediately preceding Acts 11. He covers all those points that we've just discussed, and it leads him to the inevitable conclusion that we see in verses 15 through 18. He set the stage by recounting specific details and events that clearly showed the transitional nature of the book of Acts and the fact that God was opening the door to the Gentiles for the expansion of the gospel. We'll have to pick it up there next time. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. And it's practical. Oh, Father, help us to get the theology out of our heads, through our hearts, and into our hands. Help us to learn to live like Christians. We first have to think like Christians, not merely know things like Christians, but think like Christians, as to how does this apply to real life? What are the principles that I am learning from these specific instances that occur throughout the New Testament so that I might be able to handle the challenges that face me. And so that as I face those challenges, I will do all to the glory of God. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray for your blessings on it. And we pray that you will move our hearts to obedience. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn tonight.